All right, on to the next round. Okay, for the past 10 years, technology teacher Tina Hurlbert has encouraged our community's children to use their creativity, their hands, science, and math to solve real world problems. She's also an avid hiker, and she's gonna share with us tonight her thoughts on how climbing mountains can teach us about overcoming challenges. Thank you. Um, I do think that there is definitely a thread running through <laughs> these talks tonight. Whether or not it was intentional, I definitely um, see it. Um, I love to hike. I love mountains. Um, I've been feeling the pull, and I've been wondering why. Um, I started hiking. Let me see if I can coordinate all of the things. Oh, I got it. Um, I started hiking in 2014 for a couple of reasons. The first one, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to relate to it at all, but we got a dog, and the kids promised they would walk her. <laughs> And long story short, I started hiking. Um, <laughs> the other reason I started hiking was actually because I was dealing with some pretty significant anxiety at the time. Um, my husband, Scott, who is there in the picture, and who is there in the third row, um, was diagnosed in 2012 with multiple myeloma, which I had never heard of it before as diagnosis, but it's a bone marrow cancer of the plasma cells. Um, and so I was dealing with a lot of anxiety, a lot of heavy stuff. Our kids were six and nine at the time. Um, and it was hard. So getting outside became like my, my therapy, right? And the dog's therapy. So I, needed, I found I needed to do something for myself, for my dog, get the endorphins flowing. What did Lisa call it? The cortisol something? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I started hiking pretty locally and I discovered the Blue Trails in Connecticut, which are maintained by the um, Connecticut um, CFPA, Connecticut Forest and Park Association. Um, and I was hooked. They're so close to home. It's such a gift. Um, totally hooked. And I could feel myself getting pulled back again and again. There we go. So, whoops. Nope. Hold on. I do teach technology. This is kind of funny. <laughs> 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 so I got a little bit confident with my hiking and when my friend Amy proposed in 2017 that we take our kids and hike the presidential traverse together I was like yeah sure yeah I'm a hiker I'm a hiker yeah um, and I kid you not and this third picture really sums it up <laughs> um, next to childbirth this was the most difficult thing I had ever done um, <laughs> It, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, the kids, the kids literally skipped and sang the lyrics to Hamilton the entire three days we were hiking, and that was me. Um, and I remember before we left, I asked my friend Ralph, who's a, a, like a lifelong hiker, you know, like, I'm just starting out, like, I'm really nervous, I'm unprepared, I'm out of shape, I feel like I'm in over my head, um, what do I do? And he was like, listen, just put one foot in front of the other, Take it in small chunks, and you'll get there eventually, I promise. So anyway, long story short, fast forward, um, it went well. And like I said earlier, like I got bitten by the bug. Um, my friend Rachel and I, um, just this past summer, um, but the following year, did the Traverse again. And then um, with the generosity of CVEF, Amy Schaefer, who's the art teacher, lots of your kids have probably had her at Strong School, um, started this Take a Hike Club for women who wanted to get outside in a safe way and try hiking for the first time. And it was really pretty successful. I actually see some of the folks who came on hikes with us out here. Um, they wanted to try something new and they wanted to do something um, with a group of people in the community um, and some of them were wondering, like, I don't know, I don't know if I can get around Miller's Pond. Like, can I get around Miller's Pond? Do you think I can get around Miller's Pond? And Amy was brilliant. She said, listen, so instead of looking at, like, the group goal, like, set yourself an individual summit, let's call it, for the hike. So maybe the summit is the loop, right? Or maybe the summit is, take a look at your watch, you have to be back 
to get, you know, make dinner for the kids at a certain time, 20 minutes out, and then you turn around and you go back, and that's your summit for the day. And it was really successful. Um, we encourage people to push their limits and, you know, do something new and feel really successful in a really safe way. So you've probably seen this quote, the mountains are calling and I must go. It's a John Muir quote, and um, it's on everything. You can find it, it's on t-shirts, I have a sticker on my water bottle. Um, and it, this is actually an abbreviated quote. Um, people use it, like the connotation is, the mountains are calling and I'm gonna go sit in nature, or you know, reverence for the outdoors. Um, and when he wrote this, actually, he was writing it in a letter to his sister in 1873. And he was talking about the work that he was doing to preserve and protect Yosemite. Um, and the extended quote, the part that gets left out, is the mountains are calling and I must go, and I will work on while I can, studying incessantly. Um, the mountains were calling him to do the hard work. Yes, there's reverence for nature. Yes, there's appreciation of the beauty around them, but they were calling him to do the hard work. And my friend Mary Ellen asks me all the time, like, what, what do you think your purpose is? What do you think you're here to learn in your lifetime? And it's kind of come into focus a little bit the last few years. Um, and it ties back with this John Muir quote. Um, this is a picture from this summer. My friend Rachel and I decided we're going to tackle some more of the White Mountains. And we're on our way up through Lincoln, New Hampshire. And we're going to be doing the Pemigewasset Loop, which I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it, but it's a 32-mile loop in the Pemigewasset Wilderness. We were going to knock eight 4,000-footers off of our bucket list in three days. And we're driving up the highway, and I can feel that pit in my stomach. And it was like the part excitement pit and the part, holy cow, what are we doing? You know, they're getting bigger and bigger as we're getting <laughs> closer. Um, to them and I'm thinking god like we're both teachers like we I don't have to do this this is really hard <laughs> <laughs> this is my summer vacation like we could be sitting at Rachel's pool and her husband who's a teacher could be like bringing us drinks and you know like but we're doing this hard thing by choice and why is that right um, and what's funny is the morning after we finished the hike Rachel was sitting at the breakfast table with a map like planning the next one um, and so those are just those are a couple pictures from our from our hike. Literally, like that's the trail. Like so, part of the trail is the Appalachian Trail. You can see the white blazes there, and it's just it's up and down and then up and then down again. <laughs> um, so why is it, why are we choosing to do this hard thing, right? Um, I asked myself the same question this summer when I joined the um, Moving Mountains for Multiple Myeloma. Uh, hike in Iceland. So that's run by the MMRF, the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Um, and they've made tremendous strides in new drug approvals over the last eight years. Um, are saving lives, extending lifespans. Um, but I was asking myself, like, this is going to be really hard. Like, it's going to be an easier hike than the Traverse. Definitely easier than the Pemigewasset Loop. But emotionally, like, am I there? Can I handle it. We live with multiple myeloma every day in our house. It's something that's always on our minds. And distractions are good. Lisa talked about distractions, right? Um, there would be no distractions on this trip. I would be with two patients, caregivers, doctors, um, reps from GSK and Celgene, um, and then two girls who had lost their parents, um, not sisters, but individually three and 10 years ago. So it was gonna to be tough, and I was pretty nervous about it. Um, but I knew I had to do it anyway. Like John Muir, like, something's calling, and I need to, I need to go. Um, this is Eric. Eric was one of the patients on the hike. Um, and this was a hard, this was hard. Like, he was diagnosed 10 years ago, he was 37. Same age my husband was when he was diagnosed. Um, he told me about his diagnosis, about his lines of treatment, the gratitude he felt for being able to do the hike. And you know, his doctors told him in 2008, at best, we'll get you two years. And there he was 11 years later, and he said, I realize I am not done. So we hiked. 
and that's Iceland, and it is amazing. I don't know if anybody's ever been, but it was incredible. It was moonscape and felt like scenes out of New Zealand and other spots. Um, it was incredible. So tying this back with Mjör and mountains, like there are some things that we have to do, and they're really hard. Um, distractions are good, and then we have to do the hard stuff. So we climb, right? We put one foot in front of the other. And I've come to learn like everybody has a mountain. It may not look like this one, and it may not look like cancer, but everyone has something. Um, I'm thinking, as I've been analyzing this um, over time, that the mountains are maybe there to teach me that there's something to learn in the climb, in the hardness, um, and doing the hard work. So I found like regardless of the mountain, regardless of the hike, regardless of the challenge, there are a few things that I've learned that are really kind of universal, that I can apply to just about any challenge in my life with my kids, with my work, with students, um, with my extracurricular hiking. And the first one is Ralph's advice, put one foot in front of the other. There it is. Um, after the days after Scott's diagnosis, like literally that's what I had to tell myself every day. Like to get out of bed, you put one foot on the floor and you put the next foot on the floor and then you walk forward. Um, in hiking, Rachel has her own funny thing that she does when she hikes, um, but I count my steps. And when I get to 100 steps, I either take a break or keep going. But one foot in front of the other. And that's what gets us through. This is John, he's the second patient that hiked with us. Um, and he was incredible, he was like, the, he called himself the grandpa of the group. He was in his, he's in his late 60s. Um, and I'm stealing this line from Mr. Rogers actually, because he credits his mother with saying, when there are hard times, look for the helpers. There are always helpers, look for them. Um, so John, he struggled a little bit with the steeper inclines and some of the like mobility pieces. Um, when he was diagnosed three years ago, he had 10 compression fractures in his spine and lost about five inches of height really, really rapidly. Um, on the steeper inclines, people held his pack for him while he hiked. Um, another hiker hiked behind him, you can actually see him right there, um, hiked behind him the entire time to break his fall if something happened. There was always a group waiting for him at the top to celebrate. And you're going to see that in a video at the end that I show you. There were always helpers. And that's one of the things that I've really learned in this journey. You are never alone. And my third lesson that I have learned from the mountains is it's always going to be steep. There are going to be climbs. It can seem endless. False summits is actually a real thing. Like you get to the top, you think, and then you look, and then there's more mountain, right? There's more up to go. Um, and it's, a, it, it's easy to get discouraged, right? This is hard. Why am I not sitting by the pool with a cocktail in my hand, right? Um, you come to realize you've got no idea what's gonna be up ahead. And so sometimes it's good to just stop, like my niece Tori did here, and just turn around and look at how far you have come. I did want to mention one thing. I'm going to go back for a second because I feel like I need to tell John's story because that's not exactly where it ends. Um, John was diagnosed three years ago. He told his wife in February of this last year when Cure Magazine came out with the, hey, hike in Iceland with us. It's going to be great. We'll raise money. Um, and he told his wife, like, I feel like I have to do this. Like, I know it's going to be really hard, but I've got to do it. And he did, and he knocked it out of the park. Um, he came home from Iceland, he went back to his life, and two weeks ago he texted us all, we have this big group thread from Iceland, um, and he developed what's called plasma cell leukemia, which is kind of when the plasma cell cancer from multiple myeloma ekes into your bloodstream. And um, I had finished the presentation before his wife emailed all of us to tell us that he passed away on Wednesday. Um, yes. And so that's another lesson along the way, right? I didn't add that. But things are crappy, and sometimes there's no way to really sugarcoat it, right? 
there's no like magical rainbow sometimes or maybe there is because john taught us a lot of lessons along the way right um so i want to show you ooh, no don't play yet don't play yet there we go so john talked a lot about hope the whole time we were hiking and i want to play this last clip of the hike for you we had a documentary team that followed us along as we went and they were constantly like taking pictures and videos and all that and you're gonna hear from um, John and Eric at the end. And I'm gonna end with that. I'm not gonna talk anymore after the video, but remembering along the way, those three things, right? That I've learned from all of this and all of the people that I've met, one step at a time, you're never alone. And just look at how far you've come.